the next idea we're going to talk about um, is functional groups. So all of the ones that you guys will be required to know um, are hydrophilic, meaning that they uh, attract water, uh, or like water. Uh, so the six groups are hydroxyl, carbonyl, carboxyl, amino, phosphate, and methyl. And it's going to be important not only to know the structure this way, but how to draw them. Because later on, um, when you, if you have application questions, for example, where you're required to um, infer what would happen maybe if to, uh, if a functional group was added, these are going to be really important to know, especially when you get to uh, later on in the year in uh, DNA and DNA replication and such. Um, so as I said, here are the uh, here are how they're drawn. Um, so an example of a hydroxyl group is here with the little OH on the end. Um, the carbonyl group, um, so there's two different types. An aldehyde means the carbonyl is at the end, and a ketone means it's in the middle. So the carbonyl is basically just a double bond to the oxygen. And you'll notice here that there's no H because the carbon has all of the electrons it needs. Remember that each line in one of these drawings represents two shared electrons. So we have two, four, six, eight electrons for carbon, and that's all it needs. Um, for carboxyl, you can have a carboxylic acid. And that's a pretty common one, uh, where you have the carboxyl group off to the end, or then by itself, it can become an ion. If you notice, this oxygen has a slightly negative charge. Um, same thing with amino. You can have an amine group that's attached to the end of a hydrocarbon chain, um, or you can have it in its ionized state all alone. Uh, phosphate groups are going to be really important when you get to DNA because uh, you have uh, when your DNA backbone is made of phosphates and sugars, and then you'll have uh, phosphates scattered throughout. Um, but you guys will get to that later. Um, but the phosphates uh, are bonded like this, and you notice how each one is two, four, six, and then you have the double bond with the oxygen. And then finally, we have a methyl group CH three. Um, and methyl groups are used, for example, in uh, methylation of histones. Uh, when you guys talk about um, uh, gene expression, uh, methylation can control what genes are expressed and what genes aren't expressed. So that's a really important functional group. Um, so there are different types of um, compounds. There's smaller ones and bigger ones. Um, but before we get into those, we'll talk about the two ways really to combine uh, compounds or break them apart. So dehydration synthesis, as shown in the word synthesis, is when I remove an H2O molecule to uh, bring these, uh, these separate uh, compounds together. So here you can see the uh, H2O is leaving and then all of these are being synthesized into a new compound. Um, the, the contrary um, is if I add an H2O in a process called hydrolysis, I'm going to break apart this bond because this OH can uh, fill the requirements for the end of this and the H on the end of this. Um, so macromolecules are just large, uh, are basically large molecules made up of smaller um, monomers or polymers. Um, so if, this is a really great demonstration here. So monomers, uh, they'll primarily bond in longer chains. And then as these monomers come together, they'll create a polymer. And uh, the polymer of the five monomers would be an example of a uh, macromolecule. The macromolecules are primarily long strings of polymers. Um, enzymes are um, types of organic molecules that are really important in biological function because they can lower the activation energy necessary to start a reaction. Uh, so, for example, if I put two compounds into a test tube and I want them to react, sometimes there's uh, an activation energy barrier and that enzyme will help to lower that by speeding up the process. Um, carbohydrates, um, it's really important to know the ratio. So carbohydrates contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. Um, so here you'll see examples of monosaccharides. Um, and those are the simplest types of car carbohydrates. Uh, you often see them in this structure where they have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, sides almost. Or in fructose's case, you have one, two, three, four, five. Um, galactose is the same as glucose. Um, and those, um, those just keep the carbon-hydrogen-oxygen ratio. Uh, 
um, and are simpler. And then you'll notice when we get to disaccharides, these are going to be bonded together. So here's an example of a disaccharide. So a disaccharide is when we take two monosaccharides, glucose and fructose, and bond them together. And that bond is going to be called the glycosidic bond. Um, and glucose plus fructose is going to create sucrose. And it's important to know when we talk about enzymes, if you ever hear like sucrase, anything that ends in ASE usually indicates that it's an enzyme. So sucrase would break down sucrose. Um, so that's just a really good distinction that's easy to know. If you're having an application question and you see ACE in it, you should think enzyme. Um, polysaccharides, as I mentioned before, are long chains of monomers. And uh, examples are starch, glycogen, cellulose, and chitin. And you'll see these in a lot of uh, protective membranes and different organisms that we'll get into later. Uh, lipids. So lipids are uh, fats, are lipids. And they are they're great energy stores. Um, one thing about lipids that's important to know again for an application type question is that they're hydrophobic, which means they don't mix well with water. So a great example to visualize 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 this is if you were to put oil in with water and they repel each other. Um, and the lipid composition is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, and, but there are three specific lipid types that you guys are going to need to know. You're going to have to know fats, phospholipids, and steroids. And uh, you'll notice that steroids often have uh, this type of morphology um, where they're bonded together like this. And then we'll get into the phospholipids, which will often be in cell membranes, and then uh, the more commonly known fats. So fats are made up of a glycerol um, with an OH, and fatty acids have a COOH. So you'll always start with this glycerol. So if you're building this from scratch, you'd start with the glycerol. Then you'd add your fatty acids. And if you ever see this R group, um, that means it's the variable group. So different things can bond. So an example here, they're adding a triglycerides. You notice you have your three carbon chain, um, and you bond it here with your COOH uh, to create the fatty acid. Um, so saturated fatty acids have no double bonds in the carbon chain. Unsaturated fatty acids do have a double bond. If you notice, that creates a kink. Um, the bonding pattern creates like if you, it's no longer in a linear strand. So you notice like um, cholesterol, for example, the cell membrane, uh, when you guys get to that chapter, you'll notice that oftentimes these kinks help to regulate the fluidity of membranes. Um, so trans fats and hydrogenated saturated fats um, will be sometimes um, too for example, in like butters, um, there are different types of butters that will stay hard, that will stay solid at room temperature, or depending on different temperatures, due to their uh, fat composition. So, so because these saturated fats are going to be solid at room temperature, oftentimes uh, corporations will take these unsaturated fats and add hydrogens to create this saturated structure, so that they stay solid at room temperature. That just helps them with uh, get more profit. Um, so phospholipids, um, as I mentioned, they're a component of the cell membrane, and they're going to have a glycerol attached to two fatty acids and one phosphate group. And another important thing you need to know here is that the fatty acid chains are going to be hydrophobic, while the heads of phospholipids are going to be hydrophilic. So when you go into the spontaneous generation of a cell membrane, that's going to come. Uh, that's going to become really important. So steroids, as I mentioned before, also have the fused rings. Um, they're, they're really important in sex hormones. Um, and anabolic steroids are uh, synthetic. An example is a synthetic form of testosterone. And all those do is they help uh, humans function above their normal capacity. That's why they're outlawed in a lot of sports. Um, so proteins are really the, the basic uh, unit of, of tissues, um, all kinds of different biological structures that are super, super, super important. Um, so proteins are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, um, and they often contain an amino and a carboxyl group. Um, so they can function as enzymes, transport proteins, structural proteins, and storage proteins, all of which we'll get to later. Um, so globular proteins are going to be, if you notice in B, more of like a circular shape. Um, like that 3D shape, um, while fibrillous proteins are going to have more of like a fiber-like pattern, if you think about like clothes and fibers. Um, but what's important to note about proteins is denaturation. So 
Um, if some other conditions, let's say your body gets too hot um, or the pH gets too high, although often it's with temperature, proteins can denature, meaning they'll lose this specific structure. So this three-dimensional structure is really important for the functioning of the protein. So denaturation will actually change the structure and therefore alter its function. Um, because it's really important in biology, remember that form follows function. Uh, so if the form changes, so will the function. Um, so that's why like when your body, when you have a fever, that's your body's immune response saying, okay, if I raise the temperature a little bit, maybe I can denature whatever's trying to kill me or whatever's trying to harm me, not necessarily kill in every case. Um, here we have amino acids. So as I mentioned before, the R group is the variant group. You have your carbon chain with a carboxyl on one end, hydrogen on one end, and then your amino group. Um, there are 20 different amino acids, all of which you'll learn about when you go to translation, uh, transcription and translation, and they can either be uh, hydrophilic or hydrophobic R groups. Um, and peptide bonds are what bind amino acids um, to each other, and that will create another uh, polypeptide. So if you notice, here's the peptide bond between uh, one amino acid and the other amino acid. Um, so if you notice that you add that OH and H here, um, and then that comes together. Uh, this is just a 20 amino acids. Uh, you guys will get into that later. Um, so there are four levels of protein structure. So primary structure, um, is just the order of the amino, of the amino acids, um, and that's going to be created by the peptide bonds between the amino acids. Secondary structure, this uh, chain can then become a beta-plated sheet or an alpha helix, and that just has to do with the way it's uh, with the way it's three D structured. Um, and the tertiary protein structure is when it starts to fo fold on top of each other, and that's held together by interactions in the R groups. Uh, and the quaternary structure is when two or more of these peptides are put together. And just one more really important thing is that the secondary structure um, is formed by hydrogen bonds between different parts of the backbone. So when the backbones bond to each other, it creates these two unique structures. Um, nucleic acids are polymers of nucleotides. So this is really important when we go to um, DNA synthesis. Uh, DNA replication again. So nucleic acids are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphate. Uh, again, their main function is in DNA and RNA. Uh, so if you see here, you have your base pairs, so your ATs, Gs, and Cs, your backbone, uh, your sugar phosphate backbone. Um, and nucleotides are made up of a phosphate, a sugar, deoxy or uh, deoxyribose, which is ribose, and uh, those nitrogen bases. Uh, a, T, G, or C, or in RNA's case, U. Um, here are those four nitrogen bases. You have adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Uh, uracil will be used in place of thymine uh, when you get to RNAs. Uh, and then pyrimidines, a really great way to remember them is the pyrimidine has a Y in it, and all of the pyrimidines have Ys in it. Cytosine and thymine both have Ys besides uracil, that's the exception. Uh, and purines uh, are just everything else. And the purines have the double bonded uh, rings, while pyrimidines are single. Um, nucleotides are covalently bonded um, are uh, along the sugar phosphate backbone. But you notice here those hydrogen bonds. And the reason why hydrogen bonds are used is because you don't want to use too much energy every time you have to break apart this backbone to create two new strands. Um, so that that's really important and it also allows the double helix structure of DNA uh, to be preserved. And our last slide here um, is about uh, a real-world application. So lactose intolerance um, is caused by a change in nucleo, nucleate, nucleic acids and proteins. Um, and here's a uh, picture that demonstrates how uh, lactose intolerance is spread throughout uh, and just how lactose intestine how lactose intolerance can um, affect uh, our intestines because of the lack of that lactase enzyme that would break down lactose. So that's going to conclude biochemistry chapters two and three. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know. Uh, thank you very much.